Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining today's session. Uh, my name is Toshil Khavle, and I am the co-organizer of AWS UG Group Pune. Uh, today we have with us Kaushik Mohanraj. Kaushik is working Hello, as a director. Yeah, Kaushik is working as a director operation for Blaze Clan Malaysia, and he's an active speaker in KL AWS community. Uh, he enjoys work. Is I think we hear you, Tosha. Yeah. So now I will hand over to Kaushik for the session, and we'll will. Uh, I'm not sure. Over to you, Kaushik. All right, thank you. Thank you, Toshel, and thank you, AWS User Group Pune, uh, for this opportunity. Um, and of course, thank you, everyone, whoever is uh, joining in. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, my screen is shared yet. Uh, yeah, I think so right now. All right, so uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, uh, wherever you're joining in from. Uh, so today's topic, what I wanted to talk about is about the well-architected framework, the best practices around it, uh, and the entire notion around it. So as why I qualified to talk about it is like, I've been working with Blazekin Technologies for the past uh, eight, eight years now, uh, who's a AWS Premier Consulting Partner, and I myself am a well-architected reviewer. Uh, and also an APN ambassador as part of the AWS uh, community. So as part of the well-architected review plan, we have done a couple of reviews and uh, with various customers, enterprise uh, SMEs and various other customers. And I thought that this is something that uh, our community should know, right? And this is something that we need to learn the best practices and by them and at least understand what they are. <clears throat> so as part of today's session, we will be actually doing uh, some detailing around so it'll be a uh, hundred level to 200 level course where there'll be some details with respect to what the aws uh, well architected framework is and uh, what it talks about right so we will discuss for today uh, about two pillars of the out of the total of five pillars that they have in the framework uh, and uh, let's see which one and how it goes and we'll have a quick glimpse into what the AWS Well Architected program is and what it takes to be part of it. So this is something which is very specific to our uh, partners or service providers who would be interested to know about this. Uh, so this information would be for them. And uh, all of us on this uh, on this session, we would be able to do a hands-on review. So I have a case study that we could probably take up and then uh, you know, we can have a interactive session though via YouTube comments and so and so. So that's something that I want to do where you could try out your skills and uh, take a guess as to what the review, how to do the review uh, based on the two pillars that we will discuss today. And uh, of course, a glimpse into what to expect in the next session. So this is a two part session. Uh, we will be discussing two pillars today and the next three pillars in the next uh, uh, week's uh, session. So yeah, so just to give you a uh, understanding as to what to expect in the next one as well, right? So uh, during the session, I'll have a lot of uh, uh, quizzes and polls. <clears throat> to keep it more interactive, I want you to hear out your feedback. Uh, so please, please uh, share your comments, share your thoughts, uh, ask your questions into the comments. Yeah, appreciate that. All right, so I think to start with, our first quick poll that we have is, I want to get a sense as to uh, how many people are there currently working on any of the cloud technology and AWS specific, and um, how long have you been working on that? Uh, so this gives me a sense as to what kind of uh, person and the audience we have for today's uh, session, and then we can also address those accordingly. So I think I'll take another 20, 30 seconds for those comments to come through. Uh, I'm tracking them on the comment section, so keep them coming. All right, so four years with AWS, Chirag Nair. Hey there, hi Chirag, thanks for joining in. 
We have Sagar Torkar with two years. Uh, great. We have tech training with zero experience, but certified in AWS SA. That's nice. Good to know. All right. Uh, yeah, so I think keep the uh, comments coming through. So that gives me a sense. All right. All right, that's nice. Okay, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think this. Uh, so everyone has been working with AWS for about two, three, four years on an average, which is great. So uh, that gives me a good understanding of where we are. So moving forward, uh, I'll keep it at that level. So accordingly, we can and I can go to that depth, right? So to kickstart off, uh, a quick introduction to what well-architected framework is. Uh, so framework is basically a, a boundary, a guardrail that has been developed to uh, guide your solution architects, your cloud architects, to see what is uh, there in place, what are the best practices to build a secure, high-performing, resilient, and efficient infrastructure. And I quote this from the documentation, right? And there are basically five pillars that we will be talking about today uh, uh, during this series. And for today, we'll be talking about two of them, right? So the inception of the well architected framework had basically happened earlier in 2011, 2012, when AWS uh, engineers actually sat down saying that we are doing a lot of reviews for all our customers and enterprise accounts. Uh, how can this information be standardized and be published to uh, all the partners, all the generic uh, customers of AWS who want to use it, right? So we wanted to they wanted to actually make it a public platform and improve it from there on. So that's where they actually built the basis of it and created pillars. From pillars, basically the, the five pillars that we'll be talking about, each of these pillars have a defined design principles. And we will be actually talking about each of these design principles in detail for each of these pillars. Uh, and that deduced further to be a list of questions that we would see as of today in a well-architected uh, tool. In our console, if you go in and you search for a well-architected tool, that's something that they have formulated that and created a questions, a set of questions that can be answered. And uh, we, we know what is the status of your uh, environment and your ecosystem. So uh, we will be running through the tool in the next season, uh, in the next uh, session. So that's something to look forward to in the next session. So we'll see how to do it. All right. So, the question is, I've, I've, uh, many customers ask me as to why do I need to apply a well-architected framework? You know, what is, the, what is it there in for me when I take this up? Um, so my simple answer to them is to learn and adopt AWS best practices. So though I say AWS best practices, and this is something which is developed by AWS themselves, you can actually use this entire framework in a cloud agnostic manner. It is not specifically something that is catering only to uh, the one cloud platform. The concepts is is same across all cloud platforms, right? And this is something that you can just take note of. And it is something as a basic fundamental uh, understanding that you should have as a cloud engineer or as a, or as a cloud practitioner, right? Excuse me for that. So that's what it does. It gives you the opportunity to learn and adopt AWS best practices. And while doing that, you mitigate a lot of risk right in the beginning phase while adopting it because of the best practices. So this is the general concept, right, where we actually have people who uh, do good things, follow processes. They have a better uh, quality product. So that's exactly what we're talking about. From there on, what we also uh, emphasize here is we make data-backed decisions which means that you have data points for your CXOs, your data engineers, your uh, you know, security engineers to make decisions based on this specific data, right? So this is something to take note of. And then of course, build and deploy faster. So this basis sets the basis for why we need to adopt the well-architected framework. So we'll talk about what are the pillars that we have. So AWS has set up the entire framework around five pillars, right? Which is operational excellence, security, reliability, performance efficiency, and cost optimization. 
right? So these are the five major pillars and each of them have their own design principles. So I have a quick question for you guys at this point, right? So which pillar would be the most interesting for you and that you would like to learn more about? Just drop in in your comments. That's something that I would like to understand further as to what you're doing and understand that into details. So I'll wait for the comments. Uh, out of these five pillars, which pillar, just one pillar, which is something that will be helpful for you? All right, do we have any comments in yet? All right, security performance. Okay, cost. Security cost. Security is one point. Security is a major concern for companies who are apps club totally. And that, that's something that has to be uh, debunked. All right. So I, in, in most of the uh, cases that I've seen, I think majority of them who are putting it across are saying security and cost. And I thought that is something that you would like to address. And hence, for today's uh, focus would be security and cost optimization pillar, right? So we are going to address uh, security and cost optimization for today. We'll go into depth of it while we answer the other three in the next session, right? We'll actually address them. And they are critical uh, as much as the security and cost optimization is. Uh, however, people don't uh, take priority, especially with cloud, because it's processes, it's uh, lengthy to adapt and the high risk issues are hard to resolve. So that's something that people keep it aside and you know, shove it down the, uh, down the carpet. But that's something that we have to look at and why we see that it is, uh, you know, uh, why it is uh, important. So we'll talk about that as well. All right, so security pillar to address most of your concerns. So these are the design principles that define the security pillar. We'll go through each one of them. One is implementation and strong identity foundation. Uh, enable uh, traceability, apply security to all layers, and so on and so forth. We'll go into each one of them in depth. All right? OK, so um, how many of you heard about a shared responsibility model by AWS? So it's a quick question for you. So how many of you have heard shared responsibility model? and uh, are you practicing that? Are you how aware are you of that, and how well do you practice that? So you can put in your uh, thoughts into your comments. Uh, all right. Yes. Okay. So many know Shubhangi Sagar Chirag. So yeah, thanks for your input. Uh, so basically. All right, so yes, for those who are not aware, so here you go. So basically what it talks about is there is responsibility for security of the cloud, which is basically managed by AWS. So anything on security is actually managed uh, uh, for on this layer is managed by AWS. This is not yours and my a headache of mine and yours, right? They take care of the regions, availability zones, physical security, uh, and also the management of uh, ensuring electricity, uh, power connection, water supply, all of that is taken care by AWS. That's what it means. So anything security of the cloud is taken care by AWS. So over and above, so there is until the VM layer, if you see the software is until the VM layer. Beyond that is what is customer's responsibility. Responsibility for uh, the so security in the cloud is customer's responsibility. So wherever there is from an OS layer and above, so patching is, is your responsibility. You need to do, ensure that it, the, the patching is there in place, right? Which uh, operating system you're running is your responsibility, right? Ensuring the firewall, the security groups, uh, the IAM accesses, the SaaS product if you're purchasing something and hosting on it, the data that is uh, hosted on the cloud, Everything is your responsibility. So this is a concept that you need to have it clear in your mind when you onboard cloud, especially for enterprises. They say that, you know, how uh, secure is cloud for me? This is the answer. It is same as your data center. In fact, it is less headache 
because the physical security is taken care by and aws has a required certifications in place to ensure that and they're audited for that right so that is taken care it is lesser a headache and security is not a concern for you uh, at the infrastructure layer so moving forward please take note whoever is new to this concept uh, please uh, visit this there's something called the shared responsibility model by aws they have a dedicated page for that showcasing all the details so i think that's something that you need to look at all right so i think the first uh, design principle that we want to talk about today is uh, implement a strong identity foundation by identity foundation here we mean that someone who accesses your uh, environment using a user credentials or cli right or sdks however they use it we have to ensure there is a strong identity foundation when i say so there are in a broad way there are three uh, fundamentals there that every user has to have a least privilege access when i say least privilege access this means that uh, you and me if we need we are a developer and we need access to let's say ec2 rds and s3 bucket only then we should have access only to those services and to select uh, serv uh, server instance types and service types right so that's how granular and specific the identity foundation has to be set up so why because it reduces the blast radius in case of an uh, issue and the credentials are exposed and are leaked out the blast radius is comparatively less all right so that's one second is separation of duties as a best practice in enterprises that we suggest as part of this is defining it as role based access different definition so many enterprises you cannot give every different user different access you have to define what you want <clears throat> so as an enterprise we would have someone where it says that it is a developer the other one is a im user the other one is a km kms admin all right so you separate the uh, duties of each one of them and then give them the required access only so a dba should have access only to the required dba services so separate their uh, duties and define them and granularly define that scope as well so that's where uh, probably we'll see at a later stage is where how we can efficiently use tagging uh, to use this and uh, define the separation of duties as well all right and the third one is centralize and automate so for enterprise customers right it is very normal to have more than uh, one account where we segregate the accounts where we say this is your master account this is your child account and each development team has a different uh, aws account and however what happens in this case you know as soon as you start doing it you would have about 50 aws accounts in a big enterprise it becomes difficult to manage uh, the identity let's say one particular person leaves the organization after two years and his user or her user is created in more than 10 accounts it will be difficult to trace track and then delete each of these users that's where it is important that you centralize all of this in a centralized uh, identity account call it an identity account and then do a cross account access uh, enablement so that's around centralization and then how do you automate it is actually uh, uh, an example would be tagging it along to your uh, ad uh, you know active directory so that as soon as a person leaves the organization the ad is certainly updated and that reflects and you don't have a, that person does not have access to the aws account so that's where these are the few things that happens and uh, the framework defines these best practices and to how you want to do it and how you should be doing it to ensure best practices is followed all right so the next design principle is enable traceability when we say enable traceability it is basically ensuring we can track what is happening in the account when a user logs in when a user changes something in the account uh, using their console access cli or any way right or even let's say how uh, a lambda role uh, which, which is assuming a role and then performing a action we have to be able to trace all of this so it is very critical as a first point is to monitor if you don't have monitoring you have no data points so it is very critical to enable monitoring 
Uh, there are a lot of uh, predefined uh, monitoring metrics that are available in CloudWatch, but many is not possible because uh, AWS cannot do it. For an instance, is uh, memory utilization in your uh, AWS EC2 instance. So you need to do a custom uh, you know, script setup and then push those logs to CloudWatch. So which has, they have made it better and better using the scripts and SDKs available, but still that's a manual effort. So that's where we are saying that ensuring that end-to-end -end monitoring and uh, alert is set up for your ecosystem. Next is you need to audit these things. So just logging them and keeping them in a log account will not help. So you need to be auditing this. So one point that I would like to bring and mention over here is that a uh, lot of enterprises practice a logging strategy where they push all their security logs uh, to a separate security account, all their application logs to an application logging account. So this way, what happens is uh, any logs that is happening or any even the cloud trail logs. So all of these logs go to a centralized account where anything of this happens, it, it is created, it is there in your local account, plus then it goes also to your uh, centralized logging account so that even if someone actually manipulates the uh, how do I say the the actual logs in your uh, the home server or the host server the the logs are still available in raw form right so that's a general practice that is done by many enterprises and something if you are an enterprise and you want to do it is something that you should also be doing right so they monitor and alert it and for the audit they also push the logs into a central account and they audit these action and the changes being made all right so that's the second aspect of it and then, as I mentioned, automate it by actually uh, pushing it to a different log so that your log is secure. So for security, you're doing logging, but your log has to be secure. You push it to a separate account. And then automate it by reading through your logs. Define that there is an event bridge in case there is a particular uh, event in the entire logs. You trigger something. And then uh, the remediation can also be kicked in. So that's another uh, concept where we need to take care. And a good example is where uh, I, there was a, a customer who shared that they had implemented is where they trace the logs using a SIAM tool and then that was flagged up and the user was automatically blocked. Uh, the CLI access was automatically blocked uh, and they were not able, the, the attacker was not able to continue to use it and it was all automated. So that's where these kind of tools come in handy, right? Uh, so the next design principle that we will be talking about is applying security at all layers. Why applying security at all layers is very critical. So when I say all layers, it is right from your uh, IAM access, your account strategy to your infrastructure at that network level, VPC level, your database uh, uh, passwords, how do you rotate it, how is your keys to your uh, functions and API keys managed. So we'll have to think about applying security at all layers in this principle, all right? So that is in a simple uh, framework that they say, it's called the defense in-depth approach, which basically defines all the actions that you need to take to ensure that there is security, all right? So all the examples that I took earlier actually uh, defines as to how you want to do a defense in-depth approach and apply security at all layers. So maybe those who are interested, there are a few uh, white papers available, uh, maybe which I can share uh, via the team and they can share it on uh, uh, you know the meetup uh, group. Uh, there are a lot of documents around it and I will document it and share it along with this uh, presentation with you guys. All right, so, uh, so the next aspect that we would discuss about is automated. So automating security best practices, as I mentioned, and the example that I gave is very critical. So there are two formats to it. One is you need to templatize whatever you do. So, and then automate it. So when I say templatize, so very specifically in this case is that uh, we need to have some cases where, uh, let's say using a hardened AMI tool, uh, AMI image, right? Your Amazon machine image. So how can we uh, make it as much as possible that it is hardened based on your security policies that you have internally? You template, uh, you know, you create that image, you create the golden image, 
and how do you automate it so that no developer is able to create an instance uh, using some other ami or some other image they should be it should be enforced that they have access only to this ami and they're able to use only that for any deployments be it dev environment testing environment or even for the production right so these kind of checkpoints is what will help to uh, have by using templatization and automating it so this is one example of it uh, there are many aspects that you could actually take care of while automating it so uh, let's say in case of uh, keys right how do you automate your keys using uh, kms how do you want to automate it the rotation how do it how does that happen so over years a lot of things has improved earlier when after rotation we need to use uh, you know custom lambda scripts to update uh, all of them on, on to how to use it in the earlier phase in the first iteration of when kms came in but now everything is automated using system manager and uh, you know the various other tools and uh, managed services that aws has brought in so that's something to look at and actually democratize uh, the various uh, tools that we have provided as a managed service by uh, aws right so that's very critical so the next two uh, design principles uh, is actually uh, uh, the next three in fact are self explanatory so we won't be going deep into it so each of these are actually uh, design principles on its own right so the very first uh, uh, the out of them the first one that i'm talking about is the protecting data in transit and at rest so as as it is being very self explanatory which means that ensuring you are enabling um, encryption and security at all at all times whether it's in transit using ssl enable ssl using certificate manager and various other aspects or a self signed cert and then at rest ensure that your ebs volumes are uh, encrypted your rds volumes your red shifts are all encrypted and that's how it should be so uh, so wherever you have uh, keep it encrypted on s3 how do you use a km or you know ac metrics and and then how algorithms to encrypt your data all of that is something to be looked at and that's something that we need to focus on all right uh, and then the next one is keeping people away from your data which means that ensuring that access or you know direct access to your account or to database should be minimized or uh, actually um, removed in totality as much as possible so that they don't have access to actually go in create a server or even access the ebs volumes or anything of that sort that's where the templatization and automation comes into picture where by a click of a button using cloud formation everything is done uh, everything is extracted from let's say when from s3 or whatever is required and the kms keys are extracted and everything is automated in this way you are not exposing your environment to every other developer in your team or a practitioner in your team right so that's something where you have to think as a policy as an as a philosophy within your company and within your team how do i keep uh, the access from the data uh, away from my team so that's something to look forward to and prepare for security events so it's a simple statement but how do you prepare so basically it is very important that you prepare for the worst by planning uh game days right so you ensure that there are playbooks in place which means that you by a uh, half yearly or every quarter you actually run a game day which defines that one day you set aside you actually uh you know uh, pressure to uh, stress test your environment ensure that there is some failure infrastructure level failure and then see how or, or, or let's say security failure and see how your team responds to it uh, they are prepared for it they go through the uh, defined sops and they take take up that task so that is very important so we will every team should prepare and rehearse it this is something similar to how do you you do a fire drill in your offices or in your uh, education institutions right uh, they do a fire drill a mock fire drill say there is a fire you all rush down you go and use your a uh, fire hose and all of that so this is similar you mock your uh, actually stress point and then test it out see how your team reacts and the team gets habituated to it 
and when the day comes in 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 actuality they are ready for it so these are the design principles that define for security uh so the so just defining the best practices and of course the associated aws services that are the enablers for it right so the best practices around to summarize is the identity and access management so which can we can use aws iam and uh, sts uh, tokens policies groups roles uh, and of course policies in every service like ec2 policy s3 policy and so on and so forth that's something to take a look at right and then you have uh, detective controls which you could use cloudwatch config aws config and aws cloud trail for those who are not aware of what these tools are basically cloudwatch is your cloud metric analysis which uh, can host a lot of your logs and metrics config is basically to check whether your it's a you can put up a particular check in that play, uh, in aws config saying that whether your security group is open to the internet or not a uh, scan through and highlight it and say that there is a non compliance and then can trigger automatically a lambda to correct it as well so that's something to look at and cloud trail aws cloud trail is a specific service that tracks a uh, user uh, triggered changes uh, in any form uh, either to through uh, cli or console or any other form uh, cloud trail logs all of that so detective controls using these and many others need to be in place these are the most important ones uh, infrastructure protection is basically uh, ensuring your vpc is well set up you plan your uh, uh, ip ranges your cidr blocks properly uh, you do your private subnet and uh, public subnet set up properly use of nat gateways uh, to ensure required access is available for private subnet uh, infrastructure all of that and then ensuring your security groups auto scaling groups and your hardened ami so these are the high level concepts that you need to take care while doing infrastructure protection right uh, then comes data protection as we said uh, ensure your data is in, uh, encrypted while at rest and uh, in transit so use of security groups encryption or even nacls and uh, certificate manager so these are the few services that are there in place and then incident response is where you actually perform uh, game days or automate them using cloud formation even bridge and cloud watch and of course other game days and everything so these are the things that i wanted to showcase and highlight um, and in summary say that security is a day zero activity which means that even before you start to decide what infrastructure you need whether for your compute you would use ecs ec2 or lambda you need to think about security as to what are the security measures need to be in place so always treat security as day zero activity uh, having said that it also means that it's an ongoing activity and it's a never ending activity as i mentioned you need to have game days you need to have repetitive checks and you need to have automated checks in place to ensure it's an ongoing activity right uh, beyond that being aware of the shared responsibility model and be sure as to the aspects that you need to take care while using aws environment right automate and templatize and prepare for the worst case scenario so this actually defines and summarizes the security pillar so i think uh, this uh, is what i wanted to showcase with respect to security pillar if there are any questions uh, in this that you want to take up uh, happy to do that and uh, before we go to the next uh, uh, pillar we can actually take some questions here if you want to that was a very important pillar uh, kaushik and let's see how many questions we have yeah so just uh, i'll take another 10 seconds there's some delay between the yeah. the stream and the right. comments coming in so we'll just yes, wait for that. Yes. yes. 
So I think we have a question from Chirag. Uh, anything to add on DDoS part? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, so yes, Chirag. So basically, uh, when we say about DDoS, I think uh, it is about how well you have architected it and how scalable it is, how reliable is it is. Uh, so that's something that we would cover as part of the reliability uh, aspect. Uh, it is, you know, how much you are able to withstand. So I think a good example is a recent case where they had a, a few TBs per second DDoS attack on AWS and AWS could withstand that very well, right? Uh, but having said that, they have architected in a way where they could scale. Of course, they had to throw money at the problem and they used a lot of resources, but they handled it very gracefully, right? So there is something called failing uh, gracefully as a concept where you need to have checks in place, which allows you to fail gracefully uh, so that your customer don't face abrupt issues in this. So. So that's from a resilience perspective, but from an uh, security aspect, it is very critical. And uh, we all of these points that we mentioned and being aware of the shared responsibility model in many ways. Uh, so I'm, I'm talking about it in a very broad aspect, but in many ways, it actually defines uh, how your architecture is set up and how mindful you are while setting up the entire uh, you know, the infrastructure and the policies around it. So that's something that we need to take care of. Uh, that would ensure that uh, you are well protected against DDoS attacks uh, and uh, you safeguard. And if, if at all you have to fail, uh, you fail uh, gracefully, which is, uh, which is still acceptable by your customers, right? So I think that's one. Uh, next question that Saavan, I think I can. Yeah, Saavan. Savan Mehta has a question, like how right. to convince customers from a security uh, security standpoint of view. Right. Yeah, and why why cloud is not as secure as on premise? From Manoranjan Singh. All right. So I think um, uh, I think both of the questions around the same lines as to how yeah. do I convince my customer as compared to on premise? Why cloud is more secure or less secure? The answer is uh, the the concepts of security is still the same, right? Uh, to answer uh, you know um, uh, Manohar uh, Manoranjan's uh, question is that uh, the concepts on premise or security. You can tell your customer that on premise he is spending an added expense to actually manage physical security and beyond many other aspects uh, from a TCO perspective. But uh, there is more security from a cloud infrastructure aspect. And beyond that, whatever checks uh, your customer needs, let's say uh, a firewall, a fire firewall, or uh, the required checks in place and uh, AD management, or even key management, everything, all of them are available in a scalable manner on cloud, right? So your cloud is as secure, if not more, than your on-premise infrastructure, and you have more granular uh, access to do it, so which is good and bad. So those who are not able to manage it properly will have problems. So the answer to your uh, customer's question is that they need to get you on board because you are a trained person and you do it well for them so that it becomes secure. So it's as simple as that. It all depends as to who is de deploying it for them and who is doing it for them. Are they trained and well uh, aware about the best practices and security that is to be done, right? And uh, how do I convince my customers to actually uh, uh, actually say that security, you know, how should we present it? Th this is the same answer. You can actually use a well-architected tool and the framework to say that these are the things that we are already doing and this is how you secure you are and uh, to do additional security what is required so there are a lot of compliances in place right like cis compliance uh, pii compliance pci compliance all of that is available as templatized uh, thing details in config where you just run a scan and you can just tell whether your uh, entire environment is pci compliant or not for an instance right uh, there are third party tools that are available that can do your scan uh, and tell you whether they are GDPR compliant or not. So 
basically a uh, cloud is as secure as your on premise it's up to you and the the person who's deploying it to make it secure enough so true, true hope that answers uh, the, is there any other question that we have to share no 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 uh, i think one from um, jiju uh, mm -hmm. uh, let's drop me in some point where we can mitigate okay so Okay. Certainly, I think that's a uh, that's a uh, that's a good one. Uh, I'm sure there are many ways. There are WAF tools. There are uh, you know that to ensure there is the firewall required uh, application level firewall. There is CloudFront to ensure there is uh, caching and you are managing your attack at that level itself. There's caching that can be enabled. So there are a lot of ways that that can be done. Uh, and yes, th these are the points that some of them that answer them as well. Yes. All right. Yes. So I think uh, we'll just in interest of time, uh, we have 40 yeah. minutes into Let's this on. Yeah. session. So moving on to the next point. Uh, so we have the next one, which is the cost optimization pillar, right? So as part of the cost optimization pillar, what we have is the design principles, which we say adopt a consumption model, measure overall efficiency, stop spending money on data center operations, operations, not data center, but actually data center operations, analyze and attribute expenditure, and use managed services to reduce cost of ownership. So in this, uh, we will talk about uh, a uh, few of them in depth and some we will club them and understand why that is the case, right? So, so basically what we are saying is that for design principles, uh, the first one in cost optimization is adopt a consumption model. First one saying that always right size your uh, cloud environment. So this is a negating statement as compared to how cloud is actually uh, marketed to the team, right? They say that you don't have to uh, calculate what kind of server sizing you need. Uh, upfront, you can just go in, choose whatever you want, and do it. That is right. So there is that flexibility with the cloud environment. You can go in, choose an X large, 2X large, uh, or even a micro based on your requirements, and kickstart. You don't have to spend a lot of time actually defining what you need for the next five years to lock in your infrastructure and make the purchase you can kickstart early it's fast do it but at the same time with uh, with a few uh, experiences you will see that what is the right size of infrastructure that you require for your workloads right so 10 days 15 days into your workload you will define that okay this server is speaking quite often i think this is not uh, the right size i want to scale up uh, you know vertically scale up one more size or uh, on the contrary, you would say that my utilization is always just 20% and below. I'm paying too much for this. Let's scale down to one uh, size less and then see and reduce my cost, right? So that is where right sizing plays a very important role and that has to be done gradually. And thanks to the cloud, it enables you to do in a quick manner with a few clicks instead of uh, like an infrastructure, uh, a data, uh, data center on an on-premise infrastructure where you're logged in for the next five years if your calculation is wrong, right? Either ways. So right sizing is very critical as part of the design, uh, cost optimization design principle. The next one is scheduling your non-critical resources. Here, uh, an example is that uh, there are two parts to it. I would like to answer it in two parts. Whereas one, where they say that uh, how can you schedule your non-critical is like your dev servers and your testing servers. Let's say for dev servers, you run your development environment is required only from morning nine to evening seven. Let's say idealistic, right? So morning eight to seven and during office hours is what when I need. Uh, during the night hours and during the uh, uh, weekends, I don't need it just schedule the resources to shut down take the required backups in place keep them ready and then once it's again you're on the on a working day switch it on and automate this so that it happens an example that i would like to give is uh, there are dev environments that my customers we have done for our customers is 
let's say when some person actually they we tagged it along with their uh, uh, check in check out system in their office their premise right so they just go in uh, as soon as they check in their environment actually loads up right and they have the dev environment as soon as they check out it actually goes down during the day we kept a check that during the day if they go out and come in don't switch it off so that's the thing that we did the other one that we had implemented from automation perspective is using slack you send in a message uh, and it gets uh, switches on and then uh, if there is no activity network activity we validate that and then switch off the instance uh, during the night so there are few many ways that you can automate it uh, based on fixed schedule or various other mechanisms that you can uh, look at right so this helps you save a lot of money believe me or not because you will not keep it for 24 cross 7 so at 722 hours a month uh, against that you will be spending only about 168 or 170 hours a month so that helps you save a lot of money in this case uh, testing environments you need it about for 5 hours a day let's say once in during a uat at the end of the sprint right uh, use them only then schedule it and stop them and you know uh, shut them down and uh, schedule their uh, resourcing accordingly so these are a few examples of how to do it to save costs uh, third one is utilizing the savings plan and reserved instance of, uh, of you know uh, functionality that aws provides this is a logical concept it has nothing to do the way your uh, environment would run right so this is what differs it from let's say spot instances this is a logical entity at a billing concept where let's say if you are using one server 24 cross 7 it makes sense to buy a reserved instance or a savings plan against that so that you pay as less as 50% uh, or 50% 70% less than the on-demand price. So once you know what is your consumption model, uh, opt in for a savings plan or a reserved instances. And now uh, AWS is launching this for across many services, right? Like Redshift uh, or even uh, other services that are there in place. So that's one. Uh, one point with respect to the right size that I want to mention is also the way you choose your uh, compute or uh, compute uh, strategy. Right, so either you use spot instances or you use uh, uh, EC2 or uh, ECS, or uh, is your infrastructure be able to do a microservice uh, a capability and use Lambda? In that case, you are able to scale and at the same time save costs where you're, uh, it's the servers technically you're not being charged unless and until there's an API call to that Lambda function. Right, so that's something to take care with respect to right sizing and think of while uh, doing the right sizing. So uh, the next design principle that I want to talk about is measure overall efficiency. So there are two components um, where we have, uh, that actually constitutes for the overall efficiency part, which is measure your cost for maintaining your workload, right? Let's say you are running a business, uh, which is to cater a certain number of customers, and you need to measure what's the cost for maintaining that workload was is what is a me uh, and also measure the business output for that workload so it should not be a scenario where you're running uh, a, a business where you're earning only hundred dollars but spending thousand uh, dollars and and that's the way it is sustaining right so we'll have to find a better way to do that so your basic target is to reduce your cost and increase your output in the most optimal way and there will be many ways to do that right so think of that uh, while designing and uh, approaching your uh, infrastructure, right? All right. Uh, next one is analyze and attribute your expenditure. Why very critical is that tag and define your structure, uh, your infrastructure, right? Uh, the reason uh, tag and define a structure. So the reason why we say this is like all your workloads in an account let's say it's shared by multiple uh, dev accounts and uh, all the de uh, developers are working for the various uh, accounts how do you even charge them back if you have to right how do you uh, track whether how a customer uh, how a developer is using 
what how much resources that particular developer is using is he abusing it or not so all of this is possible by adding a tag and automating it because just doing uh, and keeping that okay it requires a tag will not help so you can automate it where where uh, you are creating a particular instance uh, based on the cloud trail logs or various other logs you can actually define how the tag should be populated so there are there are ready made scripts which are available to populate the uh, key the keys of it but from a value perspective also can be automated as to what you want to uh, feed in into the values of these tags so that's one way to look at and from an organization perspective it's good way to actually define the organization and look, uh, define it for you to be able to analyze the cost which is the next one where you'll be able to measure it all of the cost that is happening you'll be able to measure it as to which department uh, who is using how much and in what case right or let's say in projects you 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 are a single uh, you know a freelancer and you're developing uh, or you're hosting servers for your customers you can use tags and then uh, allocate tag uh, cost for each of your customers accordingly right based on the actuals that uh, you are doing so this is a few way to do it uh, and also for enterprises or partners like us it allows us to attribute expenditure so that we define that in the way we approach the customers as well so we should know what is our expense to host such a uh, application next is define your ownership so uh, you have to define as to based on tags uh, who is doing what and uh, how you can actually uh, account all of these expenditure too so define ownership model within your accounts so that's something that you need to take care about all right uh, so the next two uh, design principles at large I, I clubbed it per se to to actually address them together is stop spending money on data center operation is one of the design principles and the other one is use managed services to reduce cost of ownership right so it actually answers both of these together um, the reason why now many people are uh, you know are taking up to cloud when you do for those who are been working on AWS or any cloud you would understand how beneficial uh, it is to run your infrastructure, especially those who are coming from a on-premise uh, workload environment to a cloud. Now you don't have to wait for your environment to be ready uh, for the next two months. You don't have to wait for two months for your environment to be ready. It's already kicking uh, with a click of a button. You are ready to have your infrastructure, right? And at the same time, your uh, enterprise or your company is not spending on the other uh, costs such as maintaining the infrastructure, maintaining the land, uh, the space, uh, air cooling, water supply, power supply, all of that is added overhead costs, which no customer will take into consideration while choosing cloud. So when they see cloud that uh, they will say for five years, I bought a server for X amount, your cloud servers is costing me uh, 1.5 times right but when you do a total tcu analysis of that you can actually say that you are spending more at least another 2x amount in managing your infrastructure you need system admins you need uh, you know infrastructure admin in place 24 by 7 in three different shifts working in the uh, data center you need to be paying for all your utilities your land let's say places like uh, mumbai pune and other places where land is so expensive uh, you know that is an added cost where your customer will not be taking into consideration so there these are the things that you need to say that stop spending money on data center operations right so at least reduce them because many enterprises will still need to have data data centers so that's one so it reduce them and the other one is start using managed services even on cloud moving from there and using your database on an ec2 uh, is good your speed has increased but still you need your administrators for many aspects of the database management instead of that put it on an rds right or an aurora mm -hmm. in in case of a no sql use dynamo so all of the infrastructure management all of the overhead and heavy lifting is taken care of by the cloud provider in uh, aws and then you understand the total reduction in the cost of ownership uh, as compared to just uh, apple to apple uh, comparison uh, of infrastructure to the server size in AWS. So these are the few things that uh, I wanted to highlight and uh, bring up. So 
So as part of the cost optimization uh, pillar, the best practices and enablers that I wanted to highlight is of course expenditure awareness. See where you're spending the money and spend it in, in a proper way. Right. Use Cost Explorer and AWS budgets to uh, have visibility into it. Next is cost effective resources where, as I mentioned, choose whether Lambda is a good fit or EC2 is a good fit or you can use spot instances uh, and then uh, find the best way around it. So savings plan, uh, CloudFront and AWS trusted advisor, especially for enterprise accounts who get that with uh, your uh, you know, enterprise support. You can use it for right sizing. You raise a ticket and they'll help you with the right sizing as based on the logs that they have in the back end and the, the patterns that you have, right? Uh, matching supply and demand, what is scaling and scheduling, and then optimizing over time because this is not a, a one time activity. So this again has to happen on a periodical way where right sizing is done uh, time to time and also giving you the opportunity to adopt newer features. So some, let's say some uh, AWS is launching M5 and let's say M6 is soon there. So that comes with a reduced cost in most of the cases. So ensure that you are not logged in and you're able to adopt that uh, for better pricing uh, and better performance. So those are the aspects where you define right sizing and adopt new fe newer features. All right, so in summary, always start small, uh, define what it is and then grow. Periodically review to right size and adopt new technology. Uh, establish uh, ownership of cost, monitor and analyze, and automate and use managed services. So these are the things that I wanted to call out uh, as part of the summary. Uh, and I think at this point we could take some more questions if there's any uh, with regarding with regards to this particular pillar. Yes, yes, we have uh, one from Arya. Um, so he's talking about oh, data transfer cost within account within one account i would say so yeah uh -huh. all right um okay so basically the question is around uh, any thoughts on environment wise data transfer cost aggregation dev qa prod in one account okay so uh, data cost again you'll have to be mindful as to how you're doing it uh, so and there are various strategies to address them as well so now let's say there is a requirement for uh, production data in testing how do you do it cross region whether you transfer using dms or you transfer by actually taking a snapshot and uh, sharing it across and then doing it so both ways are possible but you have to ensure that you choose the most optimal way from cost performance and time so it all the approach always depends as to uh, what is the defining criteria so no answer is the single answer for your uh, question basically it always depends as to what is the criteria that you're there is time a critical component here or just cost if cost then choose to you know cross region uh, sharing a image and then creating a service as an example so that's one that i have uh, to say but apart from that uh, within the availability zone choose how you do it uh, in most cases using a cloud front helps you to reduce cost rather than hitting your ec2 in many cases so especially for media companies and uh, uh, you know a heavy uh, content that is being shared uh, cdn is a single cost so for those who are you know to those who know like aws aws gives you a single price across right so you have a single price right from uh, even if you're a single uh, person freelancer or even if you are a enterprise with a multi-million dollar account the pricing is same so but cloudfront sometimes they give you uh, discounts with respect to you know how you want to do it uh, based on your consumption and so on and so forth, which is not public available, but that's something that happens. So, so with scale enterprises, that's something that you can talk to your account managers in AWS and uh, have them address. Correct. Thanks, thanks, Koshik. Uh, so we don't have any questions. Yeah, we may, we may proceed actually. All right. Okay. Fine. Fair enough. So. Uh, so this this actually I've just shared a few uh, 
uh, resources. I'll add some more that I mentioned earlier and then uh, share this across as a deck, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's how it is, right? All right. So uh, apart from the two pillars that we sp uh, wanted to speak about, that I wanted to talk about uh, the well-architected program. This is something uh, very specific to AWS partners. Uh, how many of you are part of an AWS partner here? Like you, you are part of the AWS, uh, you know, partner program, and there are there. How many are you? Can you just drop in into the comments if there are any over here? Yes. Okay, so yes, we have Chirag, yeah. of course. Chirag, Savan, yeah. Then okay. Abhay, Manoranjan, yes. All right, a lot of you. So I'm not sure yeah. how many yeah. of you have heard about the well-architected program in this case. Yeah. So this is something which will be of interest to you. Uh, I have some categories that is actually in public domain available, and I'm sharing it here as well, is basically uh, a win-win-win scenario. So this program is involves three uh, entities. So which is basically your customers, yourself as partners, and then AWS. Why I call this as a win-win-win scenario is basically uh, it, when you do these reviews, so you need to perform certain number of reviews as partners for your customers, right? You put in an effort as a partner, you put in effort, time and effort to do these reviews. You give them quality and then the customer sees value. So the win for the customer is, they uh, get a uh, transparency into how their account is uh, set up, their ecosystem is set up, and they know what the gaps are to you know to fill in. And for the partner, it helps them to build the required trust with the customer, or even even get business uh, using this. And AWS overall is uh, the eventual winner, where actually uh, with this, uh, the customer is happy with the platform. They continue to invest on this, and there is more expenditure on cloud. So, th hence, this is a win-win-win scenario. There are a few uh, ways that AWS actually funds this program as well, and as partners, you can reach out to your, uh, you know, account manager for this. So, this is something that you can, uh, uh, you know, talk to. So, the other one is the uh, partner qualification. As a partner, what you need to do is you need to be an advanced or higher tier partners, right? Apart from uh, the uh, Middle East, uh, Middle Eastern countries, their select uh, or the, the, the basic uh, partner tier are also allowed. But for India and other regions, we need to be advanced or higher tier partners. You need to have an executive sponsor. So someone from your CXO level or someone from a service lead level who is able to uh, say that, yes, this is something that we want to do and work with the AWS team. And you need to have at least two well-architected leads. I will share yes. what is required to be a well-architected lead in the next slide. And uh, you need to perform at least uh, two reviews per person per uh, well-architected lead, two reviews per quarter, right? And as a feedback from the customer after the uh, review is done, you need to have a CSAT uh, of 4.6 or higher, right? So that's the criteria uh, from a partner qualification. So some is to become a partner and some is to maintain your partner, you know, yes. uh, membership as part of the program so if you want to be a well-architected reviewer yourself what you need to do right uh, and this is what i mentioned that i am a well-architected uh, reviewer this is what allows me to qualify for that is you need to have a solution architect professional certification and uh, you need to attend a eight hour bootcamp training conducted by aws only then you get listed as part of the uh, program so uh, or as a reviewer as part of the thing right uh, so uh, why is this required? So when you do these reviews and when you apply for, uh, let's say, some kind of funding, this is important and they qualify this uh, on this basis, all right? So this is some information for you guys, right? So if there are any questions, you can drop in, maybe uh, we can take it as we progress uh, on this, all right? So now uh, opening up the floor for everyone, for all the attendees uh, in this uh, session, what I want to do is that give you a hands-on experience to do a review, 
right so uh, you can be active on the on the uh, on the comment section so what i want to do is basically uh, you i want one priority change up or, or more at least one from each one of you on this uh, on this uh, channel to highlight one priority change basis on the security pillar and the uh, uh, cost optimization pillar that you would do basis on the in the example that we have so here I've sh i'm sharing an example right so in this example basically uh, i have an infrastructure it's not the optimal one specifically i've kept some uh, loopholes so if you are a self you know an architect a well architected reviewer what are the changes that you would make uh, and how would you do that maybe you can add into the comments so this is more of a exercise and act and a review per se in our in our team so feel just drop in your comments uh, what are the changes that you would do uh, and let's see who gets the maximum number of uh, changes that you would do so be creative in your imagination and your expertise here yeah uh, you can go beyond as to what is mentioned here and give suggestions across pillars so yeah over to you guys come on i'm waiting for these comments yes i think there are few very obvious things yeah let's wait for the yeah. i think i think that because of the delay i think just we'll yeah yes it's populating very slow I think we have a um, Krishna yeah, has commented. Yeah. Sagar, yes. The, uh, the page, yeah. Yeah. The All right. Server, yes. Amit has something to add, yes. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Yes, Abhay. Yeah, yeah. correct, Abhay. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah correct okay brilliant i think um that's great so yes yeah. so basically so if so basically uh, if if this would have been a in in person meetup we could have had an actual review session with everyone yes. of the and teams being uh, distributed across pillars um, so yes so i think uh, it this is basically what we need to do as part of a, as part of uh, the review uh, yeah. be either you are a certified reviewer or not this is something that you could do at your organization and the workloads that you manage right so this is something where uh, this is i wanted to just showcase a basic example of how you would like to you could do it uh, but you could go beyond and uh, be imaginative and we'll actually go through the tool um, which is more actually running through the actual uh, how do i say uh, the the questions and things so some it can get a little boring but it is but you know but uh, it's good to know as to what the tool has to offer uh, it would be great for all of you guys who are there on this call and joining next week to have a look at the tool uh, and raise your queries there uh, would be happy to answer if there's any and that's something that we will do in the in, in the next uh, week session right and again in the next week session we'll probably open up the same architecture for the other three pillars and how would you do that and answer them right so right. the same uh, architecture so that's something that we would do so thank you for the answers everyone i think uh, you nailed it each one of you guys from a cost optimization perspective and even from the security perspective thanks for that input uh, this actually is helpful right so so yeah so i think uh, this is that uh, that is what i wanted to do for today uh happy to take questions uh if you want to connect i'm more than happy to connect over twitter linkedin linkedin preferably and uh answer any of your queries and we as partners are also well architected partners and uh blaze clan yeah. and ourselves and we are doing that so uh, more than happy to address your queries uh if your customers yeah great i think yeah
Mohan, we have a lot of lot of uh, uh, Koshik. We have a lot of good questions. I think because yeah. uh, all the users have paid uh, really well attention to to what you have taught mm -hmm. them. Yeah. All right. So I think uh, yes, uh, Krishan. Uh, what I would do is I will share these slides across uh, to Toshul, and Toshul can yeah. update it into our. Uh, next uh, uh you know our session and Me. we'll it will be a link to where from which you yeah. can download it uh i'll make it available and if if you're okay i will also put it as a complete session from a for the next one as well i'll incorporate them both together and put that across so looking forward to see you guys in the next session and take this forward sure yeah sure Th All thanks right. Koshik. i think you yeah, you you have the very well explained the I think topmost uh, priorities of a CXO CIO uh, from from a, um, moving to a public cloud. So mm -hmm. that will really help for everyone to make a, a I would wise decision in terms of how to to tackle those uh, concerns of a CXO or CIO. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. Uh, thanks thank everyone you. Thank uh, you again. for joining today, and we'll see you in the next session, which will be on twenty seventh um let's let's keep it uh, as interactive as we can and yep. uh, your feedbacks and suggestion are always welcome yeah yeah yep. thank you everyone thank you thank you have a nice day thanks